Just a quick report today about the complexity of modern servicing and how it's the stuff you don't know that you don't know that could cost you thousands. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, the place where new car buyers save thousands off their next new cars. Hit me up on the website for that. This report is motivated by a question from you. I am in the market for a dual cab 4x4 ute and the Ford Ranger XLT is what I have decided on after test driving other brands and models. I like to do an engine oil and filter service myself between manufacturer service intervals so my engine is always running clean. Okay, well, I guess each of us, you know, we like what we like, don't we? I like to think of myself as a kind of fishnet wearing modern day Clint Eastwood, which is as self-evidently ridiculous as performing OCD oil changes. Hypothetically, I suppose you can't hurt an engine by doing more frequent oil changes than the service manual stipulates. But many highly qualified engineers did sit down and figure out how often your engine really needs servicing. They used actual testing and data. So I'd go with their recommendation because brainiacs. I really would. Here in Shreya, if you do any servicing on your vehicle, unless you're a mechanic, you risk voiding the warranty. It really is that simple. You don't have to use an authorised dealer, but you do have to use a qualified mechanic. This is according to the regulator, the ACCC. Manufacturers can require this as a condition for ongoing warranty compliance, and there's essentially nothing you can do about it. There's no clever argument that will get you off this hook. You also have to conform to the required service schedule and use parts that are fit for purpose. Now these don't have to be genuine parts, but they do have to be fit for purpose. Also, in the fine print for many vehicles, there's a harsh operating conditions caveat, which usually advises an intermediate oil change if you operate in those harsh conditions. And this is totally fair, but what most people don't get here is that harsh conditions includes mainly short trips in cities with lots of cold starts. Because driving like that really is hell on earth for engine oil. Evan went on. I discovered the variable pressure oil pump in the 3.2 litre Ranger and Mazda BT50 are unable to reprime themselves and deliver oil pressure if they are left to drain for more than 10 minutes. Obviously this will cause catastrophic engine failure. So how do the dealers overcome this problem? Does this mean you can never let the old oil drain out completely? Is there some way to prime the pump before starting the engine? I do not want to spend my money on a vehicle if I can't do basic service and oil change myself, especially if I am traveling and not near a dealer. Any technical advice on this issue would be greatly appreciated. Okay, so it is absolutely true that the Ford Ranger and Mazda BT50 oil pump risks losing its prime if you drain the oil for more than 10 minutes. This is one of those Donald Rumsfeld style unknown unknowns. It's something you don't know that you don't know because you think you know how to change the oil. And perhaps it never crossed your mind to investigate further. These are always the things that jump up and bite you on the ass, right? Just like changing the battery. If you disconnect the battery on a modern car, it can make the infotainment system think that it's been stolen and generate a whole bunch of other ECU initialization kind of issues for you to solve, which will not be fun. Which is why people who change batteries for a living use these small auxiliary batteries, often connected to the 12 volt outlet in the cabin to power up the CAN bus while the main battery is disconnected for the changeover, which is pretty smart. And another Rumsfeldian unknown unknown. I guess it's a similar thing with many modern diesels and oil changes as well. There's an engine control ECU setting for oil dilution. 
Often you need to go in and reset that with a laptop after you do an oil change so that the engine could go on and make the right set of decisions about regenerating the DPF, which is something you don't want to get wrong. This is all complex, right? But the complexity is excusable because it's a trade-off against delivering greater benefits thanks to the technology which demands that complexity. There's really no valid argument against this, although there is obviously a balance between those two things. If you own a Bugatti Veyron, okay, it's like 20 grand to change the oil because, hey, it's complex. And you're a rich tosser, and they know. So why did Ford do this with the 3.2 in the Ranger and the BT50? because it seems superficially stupid, right? And many mechanics out there will tell you that it is. But really it's not. I mean, they had their reasons, okay? The benefit is that the oil pump varies the oil delivery in response to the revs. In other words, it's a variable type pump rather than a fixed type pump. And this optimizes the oil delivery across a range of operating revs and minimizes the parasitic fuel consumption related to driving the oil pump. Maybe additional oil flow at high revs doesn't have to be bled off through a relief valve or something. I really don't know the specifics of what they did at that granular detail level, but this is why they did it. I do know that ancillaries like alternators, water pumps and oil pumps, they're all essential for your oil, but you can derive a direct measurable fuel economy benefit by minimizing the power consumption of these things, which is clearly the objective at play here. Servicing professionals simply manage to get the new oil back in within the 10 minute window. That's how they do this. And here's the bit where Evan and I disagree fundamentally. Modern oil is quite thin, so there's no problem draining it, whipping the new filter on and refilling with fresh oil in under 10 minutes. There's no practical benefit to the engine in letting the last 12 drops of old oil fall out over the next three hours or whatever, which is what anally retentive DIY oil change nutbags often do, which is of course a bit crazy. Even if there's I don't know, 50 cc's of drainable oil still in there, and there's probably not because, you know, five minutes is rather a long time to sit there just draining. But even if there is, 50 cc's diluted against five litres of new oil or something is only 1% by volume, which is nothing. And even those contaminated, probably not 50 cc's of old oil, well, that's probably 10% contaminants and 90% viable oil. So that's like one part per thousand of contaminants once the new oil goes in, which is less than nothing in the context of long-term reliable engine operation. It is totally insignificant. To me, you know, this oil change time limit is absolutely not a reason not to buy a Ranger or a BT50. It's just a procedure that you need to follow if you own one. It has absolutely no negative consequences. Just don't get distracted, which is always good advice when you're on the tools. Evan's implication that the oil change is in some way dodgy if it's performed in under 10 minutes is just not supported by facts, inconveniently, although I would drain the sump very soon after shutdown just because any contaminants are more likely to be evenly mixed throughout the oil and the oil will be at its thinnest while it's still hot, so there's a couple of good reasons for doing it quickly. The big warning here is use a mechanic, especially while your car is under warranty. He's much more likely to know a bunch of the things that you don't know that you don't know. And don't presume that procedures you learnt several decades ago still apply to modern cars today. Cars evolve and therefore the servicing does too. And now, this. Like your content, but for God's sake, Hyundai is not pronounced as it is spelled. 
they had a huge ad campaign a while back on this point. It's simple. It is pronounced Hun Day. In the domain of obscure things, this is actually fascinating. In fact, at a global scale, Hyundai, Hyundai, whatever, cannot figure out how to pronounce its own name either. <laughs> I know unequivocally in North America it is pronounced Hyundai. Here in Australia, not so much. Get the Hyundai Tucson now in run out from just $27,990 drive away. Way more fun than your car. New Kona. Hyundai's small SUV. Hyundai Car Plan has been developed by Hyundai Finance. Presenting the new Hyundai Santa Fe. Those were representative snippets from recent official Hyundai Ars trailer advertisements. The interesting part is that 25 years ago, or whatever it was, when Hyundai first lobbed in our former convict paradise, the bogans here immediately mangled the new South Korean brand name. If you are a retardistani, okay, a bogan is like 95% redneck, but tougher because of our more venomous environment overall, slightly dumber as well, and somewhat more of a mad rooter, but only slightly. Look it up if you want. Anyway, the bogans here in Middle Shitsville immediately applied the full strine which is the official Australian dialect of the English language. And they called the new brand Hyundai. Hyundai, mate. This was very worrying for the resident South Koreans who dropped megabucks on immediate linguistic correction using the high-tech miracle of advertising. <laughs> All day, every day, Hyundai, not do or die, Hyundai. <laughs> Even a bogan could understand that, right? Well, I guess some of them, the smarter ones, but a lot of them still get it wrong today, amazingly enough. But I don't know how they resolve the ongoing official pronunciation disconnect back in Seoul. Hyundai here, Hyundai in Retardistan. I suspect they don't really care, as long as the demilitarised zone between Shitsville and Retardistan is maintained and the vehicles continue to sell in increasing numbers, of course. <laughs> that would be probably their number one goal. Just another tomato-tomato thing I think you'll find. One more minor trans-Pacific failure of a line moth. <laughs>